guys. I'm Professor Thompson, and I'm going to be recording lectures for you guys this semester because I'm hoping to add to the class instead of just having you guys read the PowerPoints. Maybe I can add to it or explain it in a different way. So the first chapter is just a basic introduction to anatomy and physiology. And one thing I want you guys to pay attention to during these lectures are any words that might be in red font or blue font, because that means that you really need to pay attention to those words and you might see them again on a test. So first things first is how did medical science even come about? Well, back in the day, people actually believed in magic and were very superstitious. So their healing techniques were what we would say out of the realm of how we practice medicine today. Some people are still very superstitious and even I still throw salt over my left shoulder if I spill some and that's okay. But we need to realize that medicine has advanced quite a bit because we have studied medicine and how wounds heal and we use cadavers in order to find things out about the body. Technology has also improved a lot. So we have microscopes and different sterilization techniques. So this has also helped improve medical science. But all of the past observations that they did with dead bodies, some of them they actually had to do in secret and steal the bodies. But basically what it did was it led to experimentation and they created these terms, anatomy and physiology. So they would dissect cadavers and actually learn how the body worked and what illnesses did to the body and how the body functioned. So it's important to understand the difference between anatomy and physiology. Anatomy studies the structure and morphology of the human body and all of its parts. It actually comes from the Greek word for cutting up. Physiology, on the other hand, studies the function of the human body and its parts. That's derived from the Greek for relationship to nature. So anatomy studies the structure and physiology studies the function. So even though there are two different words and two different realms, you would say, they still go together because structure and function always go together. The structure of organs and the parts of the human body is going to determine the function. So, for example, our body skeletons are designed the way they are so that we can walk upright versus tigers whose skeletons are designed their particular way so they can't really walk upright. So the structure of the skeleton determines how the organism can walk and function. So structure and function will always go together. So while anatomy and physiology are essentially two branches, you study them together because they can't really be separated out. You can't understand the structure without the function and you can't understand the function without the structure. So they go hand in hand. So the first important thing to understand is how organisms are organized. We have non-living, particles, you would say, that are composed of chemicals, and then those are going to combine to eventually get to the living particles. So subatomic particles, talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons, make up cells. And then these subatomic particles are actually going to combine to make up atoms, which are chemicals like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, everything you would see in the periodic table of elements. Atoms will then combine to form molecules, which, for example, water and glucose. Macromolecules are large particles that are made up of molecules. So you should see a pattern at this point. Subatomic particles combine to form atoms, atoms combine to form molecules, molecules combine to form macromolecules like DNA and proteins. Organelles are the functional part of a cell. Organelles are actually tiny little factories that each have their own function, like mitochondria make ATP, which is the energy of the cell. Lysosomes degrade things. 
So then these organelles are part of the cell, which is the basic unit of structure and function for living things. Now we have a lot of different types of cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, blood cells, just for some examples, but there's a lot of different types. Cells will combine to form tissues, and tissues like adipose tissue, um, nervous tissue, muscle tissue, and then tissues will combine to form organs, like the stomach, the kidney, the heart. Organs combine to form organ systems. So organ systems are organs that all have a common function. We have 11 organ systems in our body that we'll talk about in a little bit, but the digestive system is just an example. And then finally, there's organism or organ systems combined to make up an organism. So all of these organ systems are interacting to make humans what we are. So the important thing is that subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, macromolecules, these are not living things. We will talk about these things in the next chapter on chemistry. But life begins at the cell. So the cell is the basic structure and functional unit of life. So all living things are made up of cells, as the cell theory states. Hopefully you remember that from biology. And then cells make up tissues, which we will cover in chapter five. And then tissues make up organs, which make up organ systems. And finally, organism, which is what we are, which is what we really care about because the bottom line is anatomy and physiology studies humans. This is just a picture showing you that atoms combine to form molecules, which power macromolecules and so on to finally get to the organism. Clinically, we have non-invasive procedures that can actually provide images of these structures. So we can use ultrasound, which is high frequency waves that actually will provide images of the soft, soft internal structures. Ultrasounds are often used to look at a fetus while it's in the uterus. So if you're pregnant, you will probably go for at least one ultrasound during your pregnancy. But ultrasounds are also used to diagnose other issues in the abdominal area and even the thoracic area as well. MRI or magnetic resonance imaging actually uses a magnetic field and it spins the atoms to where it provides a high resolution image of the internal structures. So you can have an MRI to see your brain activity and how it is working. You can also have an MRI for any spinal injuries to see what's going on if you have a ruptured disc or something. So MRIs are really useful in addition to ultrasounds. And these are both non-invasive procedures that do not hurt. So what does it mean to be living? Characteristics of life are actually really important. So this chart, you'll notice characteristics of life is in red, which means that you should pay attention to this chart. Make sure you're familiar with these processes and some examples of the processes. So living things move. Living things are responsive to changes in the external internal environment. Living things grow and reproduce. Living things perform respiration, which is basically obtaining oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. Living things will digest, will break down substances into simpler forms, which can then be absorbed through absorption. Circulation is the movement of substances in our body fluids. So circulation is going to get things where they need to go. Assimilation is an important one. That's when you're changing the absorbed substances into different forms. So let's say you take in um, a chemical energy and then you transform it into mechanical energy. And finally, excretion which is the removal of waste produced by the metabolic reactions. So make sure that you are familiar with all of these processes and what they are. So metabolism in general is the sum of all of the chemical reactions in our body. And these characteristics of life are the main part of metabolism. So we add up all of the chemical reactions and you might have heard before, like you have a high metabolism or somebody has a low metabolism. That basically just refers to how fast the chemical reactions occur in your body. So if they occur really fast, it said you have a high metabolism. If they're kind of slow, it says you have a low metabolism. 
So life does depend on five environmental factors as well. Water is an inorganic molecule and it is the most abundant inorganic molecule in our body. And you actually need to know that. It's important for metabolic processes. Water is a universal solvent and a lot of our chemical reactions can take place in water. It's also required for the transport of substances. Most of our body is water. So our blood is mostly water. So blood transports a lot of substances around our body as it's the main liquid medium that we have in our body. So blood is going to stick together because of the components of water. And it's also going to stick to the sides of the blood vessels because of the properties of water. So water is really important for survival. It also helps regulate our body temperature. Food is the second factor. Food provides necessary nutrients and supplies energy. It's also going to help supply materials so that we can build other things. So we take in food and we break it down to its components and then we will use those components to build other things. Oxygen is important. It's used to release energy from nutrients as a gas, of course. We breathe in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. Heat is important. It's a form of energy in our environment, but it helps maintain our body temperature and also partly controls how fast the chemical reactions happen in our bodies. And then pressure is the last one. This is the application of force on an object. Atmospheric pressure is important for breathing, and you will learn about that in the second semester of this class. And hydrostatic pressure is what keeps blood flowing. And you will also learn about that in the second semester of this class. Now homeostasis, the definition is basically maintenance of a happy, stable, steady internal environment. We have mechanisms to self-regulate and monitor our internal environments and correct them as needed. So there are three parts of a homeostatic mechanism. The receptor is what's going to detect any abnormalities and give information about those stimuli to the control center. The control center is the decision maker that maintains a set point. So let's say temperature, for example. We keep our temperature within a narrow range. If your temperature is 99, you're not gonna to run to the hospital because you have a horrid fever. 99 in most cases isn't even really considered a fever. If you have a temperature of 97.8, you're not gonna to rush to the hospital because you have hypothermia. It's a normal range. And then the effector is gonna be the muscle or gland that responds to the control center and brings about whatever the change needs to be. So let's say our temperature goes up. We have receptors that are going to detect that temperature increase. They're gonna send the information to the control center, and then the control center is gonna send out a decision to the effectors, which in this case would be our sweat glands, to start sweating so that we can cool our bodies down to get back to the normal range. This is just a picture showing you, so you have a stimulus, you have a change that occurs, the receptors are going to pick that change up. They're gonna send the information to the control center. And then the control center is going to send out a decision for the effector. And the effector is going to respond to bring it back to normal conditions. We have two types of feedback mechanisms. We have negative homeostatic mechanisms and we have positive homeostatic mechanisms. This picture is representing temperature, as I just said. So, if your body temperature gets too high, that's going to be the stimulus. The receptors are going to pick up that, send the information to the control center, and then our blood vessels are gonna dilate and our sweat glands are going to sweat, bringing our body temperature back to normal. On the other hand, if our temperature gets too low, the receptors are going to pick that up, send that information to the control center, which will then constrict our blood vessels to decrease our blood flow, keep the sweat glands inactive, but also signal the muscles to start contracting to generate heat. We would call it shivering. So if you get too cold, you start to shiver. That's actually your muscles trying to generate heat. You can compare it to the thermostat in your house. You set your thermostat to a desired point. If it gets too hot, the air is gonna kick on, 
or yeah, if it gets too hot, the air is going to kick on. If it gets too cold, the heat will kick on. A positive homeostatic mechanism is kind of the opposite. It's going to amplify the response. So there's two examples that we always use, blood clotting and childbirth. So with blood clotting, if you cut your blood vessel, what's going to happen, our platelets are going to come to the area and send out chemicals to get more platelets to the area. And more and more platelets are going to keep coming until the cut is sealed. With childbirth, the baby pushes on the cervix, the uterus is starting to stretch. That's going to stretch the cervix, which will be picked up by the stretch receptors. It's going to send that information to the decision center. Oxytocin, which is the hormone that causes uterine contractions, is going to be released. More oxytocin is going to cause stronger contractions. So basically, more stretch and pressure on the cervix means stronger contractions because more oxytocin is released until the stimulus is gone being the baby is born so platelets will release chemicals to get more and more platelets until the stimulus is gone meaning the cut is repaired or clotted i should say the baby is pushing on the cervix pushing on the uterus stretching it out oxytocin will be released causes uterine contractions, more pressure and stretch, more oxytocin, stronger contractions until the baby is gone or born, sorry. So positive feedback amplifies the situation. You can compare it to a speaker and microphone amplifying sound. Negative feedback, you have the opposite happening. So if temperature goes up, we're gonna bring it down. Positive feedback, you amplify the situation. So negative feedback is the most common type of homeostatic mechanism that we have. The effectors are going to basically return the conditions to the normal range. So it'll have the opposite response, which is why it's called negative feedback. The response is going to move it in the opposite direction. So this is going to prevent sudden severe changes in our body. Negative feedback controls body temperature, blood pressure, and glucose level in the blood just for some examples. But the majority of things in our body are controlled by negative feedback. Positive feedback is relatively uncommon. The change is intensified instead of reversed, which is why it's called positive feedback. The activity of the effector is initially going to increase instead of decreasing. This is a very short-lived response, and basically it's going to produce unstable conditions initially, but then it leads to homeostasis because it stops whatever was happening. So blood clotting, you're going to have platelets come until the blood is clotted and the bleeding is stopped. Uterine contractions, they're gonna get stronger and stronger until the baby is born. Okay, how is our human body organized? The human body consists of two main portions, the axial portion and the appendicular portion. So the axial portion is the center portion, the head, neck, and trunk. The appendicular portion are the upper and lower limbs. The axial portion has some major body cavities though. The cranial cavity houses our brain. The vertebral or spinal cavity contains the spinal cord. The thoracic cavity has the lungs and the thoracic viscera. And the abdominal pelvic cavity actually contains the abdominal and the pelvic viscera. It can be separated out into the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity, but for the most part, it's just the abdominal pelvic cavity. The diaphragm is the muscle that separates the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. The mediastinum is the region between the lungs and the thoracic cavity, and it contains the heart, esophagus, tracheus, and thymus gland. As I said earlier, the abdominal pelvic cavity actually has two portions. The abdominal cavity extends from the diaphragm to the top of the pelvis, and it contains the liver, spleen, kidneys, stomach, small intestine, and majority of the large intestine. And you guys need to know that. The pelvic cavity is enclosed by the pelvic bones, and it contains the end of the large intestine, the bladder, and the internal reproductive organs. And as I said, you guys have to know that too, it's in red. 
This is just a picture showing you the cranial and vertebral cavities versus the thoracic, diaphragm, abdominal, and pelvic cavities. And then on the side here, you can see the cranial cavity and vertebral cavity, but then the thoracic cavity is further subdivided. You've got the left pleural cavity and the right pleural cavity, and each one of those houses the lung. And then you have the pericardial cavity in the middle, which houses the heart. And then the diaphragm separates the thoracic from the abdominal pelvic. And then you have the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity within that. Smaller cavities in our head, we have the oral cavity, nasal cavity, the orbital cavities with our eyes, and the middle ear cavities. So the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities are lined by serous membranes. Serous membranes are double layer membranes that actually secrete serous fluid in the middle. Now the serous fluid is very important because it reduces friction between the layers. So our organs can kind of move freely because of serous fluid. It's going to prevent any friction that would happen. So if our heart is pumping and our lungs are breathing, they're pretty close together. So without that serous fluid, they'd be rubbing up against each other and would eventually probably stop working. So the serous membrane has two layers. The visceral layer is the inner layer that covers an organ, and the parietal layer is the outer layer that lines the cavity. So the visceral layer will be right on top of the organ, so right on top of, let's say, the heart. And then the parietal layer will be lining the cavity. So the visceral and parietal pleura are around the lungs and the thoracic cavity. The visceral and the parietal pericardium are around the heart and the thoracic cavity. And the visceral and parietal peritoneum is around the abdominal pelvic organs. So the visceral pleura will be on the lungs. The parietal pleura will line the cavity. The visceral pericardium will be on the heart. The parietal pericardium will line the cavity. And then the visceral pillar peritoneum will be around the abdominal and pelvic organs. And then the parietal peritoneum will line the abdominal pelvic cavity. This is just a picture showing you the serous membranes of the thoracic cavity and the serous membranes of the abdominal cavity. As I said earlier, we have 11 organ systems. Briefly stating the functions, you have the integumentary system, which is our skin, hair, and nails. We'll talk about that in chapter five or six, chapter six. Functions and protection, temperature regulation, sensory reception, and very importantly, production of vitamin D. Skeletal system, we talk about after the integumentary. It's the framework. So it provides um, our framework of our body and it dictates kind of what we can do. Also provides protection, attachment sites for muscles. It stores inorganic salts. Very importantly, it makes blood cells and it functions in support for movement because the muscles use the bones as a site of attachment. Muscular system, movement, it's the main source of body heat. We shiver when we get cold and that makes heat, but the muscles also help us maintain our posture. The nervous and endocrine systems are the big two systems of our body. They are in charge of our body. They basically integrate and coordinate all of the functions of our body through either nerve impulses or hormones. We'll talk about the nervous system at the end of this semester. You talk about the endocrine system next semester. The cardiovascular system is the transport of gases, nutrients, blood cells, waste, basically everything. Lymphatic system is the transportation of fluids, lymphocyte production, and body defense. And both of those are covered next semester. The digestive system, notice it's in red. It receives food, breaks down food, and excretes waste. The respiratory system is exchange of gases. The urinary system is also sometimes referred to as the excretory system because it removes blood waste, regulates electrolyte and water balance, and blood pressure. So excretion, remember, was a characteristic of life. So we have to get rid of these wastes somehow. So that's how we get rid of waste. And the reproductive system, you have male and female. They produce and transport sex cells. The female also gives birth, of course, and provides an area for gestation to occur. 
So here's a chart with the organ system, the main organs, and the major functions. Make sure you're familiar with it. As I said, we cover the integumentary, skeletal, muscular, and nervous system this semester, and then the rest are covered next semester. As we get older, of course, changes are going to occur to our whole body. Our hair might become gray or white because it loses the pigmentation. Our skin is going to wrinkle, and we're also going to lose the subcutaneous fat we have under our skin. So that's going to also cause us to be colder because we do not have the insulation that we once had. It's also going to stiffen because our collagen and elastin molecules are going to decrease. Our percentage of fats in our tissues increases. Our blood pressure may become higher. Our blood glucose may become higher, so diabetes is more likely. Our tissues start to atrophy, which means they start to die and our organs will actually shrink. Some of our cells are going to lose their ability to divide because every time they divide, they lose a little bit of the chromosomes. Our metabolic rate is going to decrease. Enzyme production and other proteins production are gonna decrease. And unfortunately, some individuals develop dementia and or Alzheimer's disease. So getting older sounds like it's bad, but Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20 actually released a song called One Last Day. And the basic point of it is every day that you live, you're one less day from dying young. So look at getting older as a benefit. Look at it as a privilege because not everybody gets to do it. So yes, all of these horrible things might happen as we're getting older, and we're losing our hair, we're getting colder, or our organs are dying, and all of these things happen, but at least we get to go through it and have them happen. Just a little side note for y'all. Okay, anatomical position. Standing erect, facing forward, upper limbs at the sides, palms facing, facing forward. All of the anatomical terms are going to be based on somebody standing in this anatomical position. So that's an important thing to realize. Superior means above, inferior means below. Anterior or ventral is towards the front. Posterior or dorsal is towards the back. Medial is towards the midline, laterals away from the midline. Bilateral means you have a structure on both sides, it's a pair. Ipsilateral means something's on the same side. Contralateral means it's on the opposite side. Proximal means it's close to a point of attachment to the trunk. Distal means it's further away. Superficial means it's close to the body surface. And deep means it's more internal. If you learn these things on your body, and when we get to the bones, learn them on your body, and the muscles, learn them on your body, it's a lot easier to learn them because if you learn them on your body, you're always going to have your body with you. So when you're taking a test, if you've learned something on your body, you can actually look at your body and figure out the answer to the question. So try to make sure you're going through all of these things on yourself and learn them on yourself because it's going to make things a lot easier down the road. And talking about learning, repetition is the best way to learn stuff. If you repeat it over and over and over again, you're going to remember it. So think about a song you hear on the radio. You hear this song over and over and over again. Do you go to Google and look up the words and try to learn the words that way? No, you don't. You learn them because you have heard this song so many times and the repetition, you start singing it whether you like the song or not. So if you approach your studies the same way, it's probably the least painful way to learn. Read things out loud. If you can explain it to somebody else, then you understand it. So read things out loud and just keep repeating them over and over and it's eventually gonna stick. Here's a picture showing you the words that we just covered with a woman standing in an anatomical position. We can also divide the body into sections or planes. Notice these are all in red. You need to be familiar with these. So a sagittal section means that you have a longitudinal cut that divides the body into left and right portions. Mid-sagittal means it's down the middle. So it divides it into equal left and right portions. 
parasagittal means it's unequal. So it divides the body somewhere off of the midline. Transversal horizontal section divides it into superior and inferior portions. And then a coronal or frontal section divides it into anterior and posterior portions. So you get a front and a back, essentially. Here's a picture showing you the different cuts. So again, make sure you're familiar with them. Here's a picture showing you the different cuts on a brain. And here's a picture showing you the different cuts on a bone. Finally, these are the body regions and quadrants. Notice it's in red, so you need to be familiar with these. As far as quadrants go, you have just the simple upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left. So remember your body in anatomical position. So your left would be your actual left. So you've got the left upper quadrant, you've got the right upper quadrant, and then you've got the right lower quadrant and the left lower quadrant. The abdominal regions, however, are a little more complicated. You've got the umbilical region right in the middle, and then the pubic region is below it. Epigastric is above it. Gastric means stomach. Epi is above, so it's above the umbilical region, and you're going to have the stomach in there. And then next to the stomach region, you've got the hypochondriac regions, the left and the right. Next to the umbilical region, you've got the left and the right lateral regions. And then next to the pubic region, you've got the left and right inguinal regions. Make sure you're familiar with these regions. Make sure you're familiar with organs that you might find in there. And keep in mind, organs are going to probably be in multiple regions. But the point of these regions and quadrants is that if somebody has pain in a particular area, the nurses and staff can then tell the doctor that the pain's in the right upper quadrant or the pains in the epigastric region. And the doctor is then going to know what area to search and also know what possible organs could be impacted. So that's all for chapter one. Hopefully it wasn't too boring. I try to add a little bit to my lectures to keep you all interested, maybe make you laugh a little bit. And I will talk to you when we cover chapter two. Bye.